Welcome back to the Art of Climate Modeling. Today we'll be talking about some of the unique problems in Earth's system modeling that arise because the atmosphere is a highly stratified fluid. That is, the structure of the fluid in the vertical direction is far different than its structure in the horizontal. This opens the door to a number of design choices in the dynamical core that can have substantial impacts on the quality of the solution. The outline of this lecture is as follows. We'll first motivate this topic by talking about the unique aspects of the vertical, then give an overview of vertical coordinate systems and terrain following coordinate variations, followed by a discussion about dealing with computational modes and vertical staggering. As you're likely aware from previous courses, the atmosphere is a very thin layer around the Earth. While the mean radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometers, the atmosphere only adds an additional 100 kilometers. And of that 100 kilometers, most shallow global atmosphere models are only designed to capture the troposphere accurately. That is, the lower 10 to 20 kilometers of the atmosphere. This is in contrast to deep atmosphere models such as the Whole Atmosphere Community Climate Model, or WASM, which is based on CESM and capable of capturing the atmosphere up to the thermosphere. So while the horizontal grid spacing for CMIP class models is on the order of 100 kilometers, the vertical grid spacing is only on the order of tens to hundreds of meters. Thus, individual grid cells cannot be well described as boxes, but instead are more like very thin pancakes. The aspect ratio in this context, that is the ratio of the horizontal scale to the vertical scale, is on the order of a thousand to one. Within the lower eight kilometers of the atmosphere, which represents the distance from mean sea level to the top of the highest peak, there can be dozens of grid cells or more. In addition, the vertical momentum equation includes gravitational acceleration, which is responsible for driving the atmosphere towards hydrostatic balance. This leads to strong vertical stratification of the atmosphere and large gradients. We also learned in Introduction to Atmospheric Dynamics that deviations from hydrostatic balance are very small typically. Thus, it can be difficult to employ the vertical momentum equation as a predictive equation, as it's very sensitive to small deviations from hydrostatic balance. Differences in both dynamic and thermodynamic quantities occur over relatively short distances in the vertical. For example, in just the lower 10 kilometers of the atmosphere, temperature varies from around 15 degrees Celsius at the surface to minus 80 degrees Celsius at the tropopause. Air density also drops off exponentially and winds increase rapidly, reaching speeds of 100 meters per second or more in spots. Additionally, the vertical dimension has actual boundaries in the atmosphere, a hard surface at its bottom boundary and outer space at its upper boundary. This means, if we're interested in preserving conservation of mass, we need to ensure that there is no flow of air through the surface and no loss of atmosphere to space. At that upper boundary, we can either use a coordinate transform to allow computers to represent infinite altitude, for example, use a zero pressure condition, or set a model cap, that is, a maximum altitude for the simulated atmosphere. Both options have unphysical consequences for the behavior of the atmosphere, particularly at its upper levels. Additionally, there are many subgrid scale processes that are particularly important in vertical columns, including convection, boundary layer effects such as turbulence and viscous processes, radiation, and vertically propagating waves. These waves are responsible for processes such as gravity wave drag. This process was originally missing in the original global climate models, and as a consequence, these original models had upper level winds that were too strong. Vertically propagating waves also cause some issues when resolved by the dynamical core. Because of the unphysical effects that manifest from our treatment of the upper boundary, we often need to include additional numerical viscosity near the model top in, order to, in the form of a sponge layer to prevent unphysical wave reflection. We'll talk more about sponge layers and Rayleigh friction in a future lecture. With this in mind, there are a number of considerations that must be taken into account when designing dynamical cores to properly handle the exchange of information in the vertical. First, there are different equation sets that one can choose, ranging from the unapproximated Navier-Stokes equations to a variety of soundproof equations which do not support vertically propagating wave modes. Secondly, there are different coordinate systems in the vertical that have implications for the discretization and the amount of computation needed. Third, there are several different options regarding the bottom boundary conditions. One can modify the coordinate system to account for bottom topography, or can allow topography to cut through individual grid cells. Fourth, even after an equation set and coordinate system have been chosen, one needs to worry about whether or not variables will be staggered in the vertical, and if they are, which variables are to be staggered.
We're going to discuss each of these options in order, starting with our choice of equation set and vertical coordinate system. Perhaps the most complicated equations we could employ for dry hydrodynamics are the fully unapproximated non-hydrostatic atmospheric equations. These are equivalent to the Navier-Stokes equations in spherical geometry and include three prognostic equations for dynamics, two prognostic equations for the thermodynamics, and one constraint equation in the form of the ideal gas law. This is also our starting point when it comes to examining different equation sets. The first approximation commonly employed in these equations is neglecting the physical viscosity term. This is done for two reasons. Firstly, this term is much smaller than the other terms in the free atmosphere. If you go back to our discussion on this term from atmospheric dynamics, you may recall that for large-scale mid-latitudinal flows, this term is actually nine orders of magnitude smaller than the pressure gradient and Coriolis terms that support geostrophic balance. Secondly, this term tends to be swamped by the artificial or numerical viscosity that is added to stabilize the solution and avoid energy accumulation at the finest scales. It's actually been said that if the numerical viscosity coefficient typically employed in atmospheric models was interpreted as a physical coefficient, it would mean that the atmosphere was more analogous to oil than to air. The second approximation commonly employed in these equations is the shallow atmosphere approximation. Under the shallow atmosphere approximation, we assume that the atmospheric grid cells do not change in size as altitude is varied. This has several consequences for the geometric terms in these equations. First, it requires that all occurrences of the radius r in these equations is, are replaced by the mean radius of the planet, denoted a. Second, it has the effect of removing all vertical geometric terms, in this case the two terms involving vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity equation, and the u squared plus v squared over r term in the vertical velocity equation. Third, it removes the cosine Coriolis terms. And fourth, the gravitational acceleration, which would normally vary with distance from the center of the planet, is replaced by a constant acceleration. With both the zero viscosity approximation and shallow atmosphere approximation, the equations of motion reduce to the much simpler form shown here. The terms we're likely most familiar with still show up here. We see the Lagrangian time tendency of the dynamics on the left-hand side of the first three equations, and curvature, pressure gradient, gravity, and Coriolis terms on the right. The thermodynamic equations are unchanged under these approximations. While these equations seem like a reasonable choice, there are various good reasons for wanting to work in a different vertical coordinate than altitude. When a new vertical coordinate is employed, two changes need to be made. First, you need to be made aware of how to convert from one coordinate set or labeling of grid points to another coordinate set, particularly when outputting data to the user. Second, the spatial derivative terms in the equations of motion must be modified because derivatives are being taken along different surfaces. Finally, these new coordinates induce a new vertical velocity, that is, the Lagrangian change of the coordinate in time. These coordinate transforms are generally discussed in more detail in atmospheric dynamics when deriving the equations in a pressure-based formulation. For an arbitrary choice of vertical coordinate eta, the transformation rules needed are laid out on this slide. Essentially, any strictly monotone field could act as a vertical height coordinate, though obviously some choices make more sense than others. The monotonicity requirement does eliminate some variables from consideration, such as temperature, which can increase or decrease in the vertical. However, because the atmosphere is highly stratified, pressure tends to work well except at very fine scales where it may be locally non-monotone. This is typically not an issue for coarse resolution uh, global circulation models. Other options include hydrostatic mass or potential temperature, and other coordinate systems could be defined in such a way that the planetary surface ends up being a coordinate surface. The employ of a new vertical coordinate has three consequences. First, the horizontal pressure gradient force separates into two terms. Notably, there are only two choices of vertical coordinate that actually preserve a one-term pressure gradient force, vertical height coordinates or vertical pressure coordinates. Second, we obtain a new prognostic equation for height from the definition of the vertical velocity. This equation was unneeded for vertical height coordinates because the vertical height was prescribed. Third, we obtain a new mass variable known as the pseudo-density, which intuitively corresponds to the air density times the distance between adjacent surfaces of constant eta.
While these equations are rather complicated looking, they are a very general form of the non-hydrostatic equations of motion and can be simplified with each choice of vertical coordinate. To give an example, let's consider vertical pressure coordinates. In this case, eta equals pressure, and the equation simplify is shown here. The pressure gradient force again reduces to a single term expression, and the coordinate velocity in this case is the familiar vertical pressure velocity omega. However, these equations do have one issue that make them a bit difficult to use in practice. The vertical pressure velocity omega must be obtained from the dynamic velocities u, v, and w, and thermodynamic variables in a rather awkward way. We'll revisit these equations shortly. There's one big issue with the non-hydrostatic equations that we've completely glossed over so far. Namely, regardless of whether we're solving the fluid equations in the horizontal or the vertical, we must respect the CFL condition that we discussed in the last lecture. Recall that the CFL condition restricts the time step size to some function of the grid spacing and the maximum wave speed of the system. In the atmosphere, the fastest waves are sound waves, and these have a maximum speed of around 342 meters per second although the actual speed varies a bit depending on the temperature of the environment. Because of the pancakey nature of our grid cells, this means that the horizontal time step size will be restricted by the grid spacing in the vertical direction, which is a thousand times smaller than the grid spacing in the horizontal. So what kind of time step restriction is actually imposed by the grid spacing? We can calculate this directly from the CFL condition. For a horizontal delta x of 110 kilometers, we get a maximum time step size of 321 seconds, or just over 5 minutes. On the other hand, for a vertical delta x of 100 meters, we get a maximum time step size of 0.3 seconds. Thus, if our time step size were limited by the vertical grid spacing, we would require around a thousand times more computation, which would dramatically slow down our atmospheric models. This restriction is thus particularly severe, and an obstacle to successfully simulating the atmosphere. However, sound waves propagate much more quickly than the actual wind speed and carry far less energy than the wind. In fact, sound waves are largely irrelevant to meteorology, and there would be little impact to our forecast skill if we simulated them poorly or removed them entirely from the system. There are a few options for overcoming the time step limitations imposed by the small vertical grid spacing and rapidly propagating vertical sound waves. We've already discussed one of those namely, implicit-explicit Runge-Kutta methods. If we can isolate the terms responsible for vertically propagating sound waves, namely vertical pressure gradient force and vertical mass fluxes, then we can solve for the time tendency of these terms using an implicit scheme which does not impose a time step limit, while maintaining the computational efficiency of an explicit scheme in the horizontal. However, we can also remove vertically propagating sound waves from the equations entirely, again noting that they're largely irrelevant to predictability. Several options are available, including the hydrostatic approximation, the anelastic approximation, the pseudo-incompressible approximation, and the unified approximation. Of these options, the vast majority of global atmospheric models employ the hydrostatic approximation. The basic assumption underlying the hydrostatic approximation is that the atmosphere adjusts instantaneously to hydrostatic balance. Normally, the adjustment to hydrostatic balance would be driven by, ver by vertically propagating longitudinal waves, but by assuming instantaneous adjustment, we effectively remove these waves from the system. This seems like a reasonable assumption, but it is notable that the hydrostatic approximation is only justifiable when the horizontal grid spacing in the model is greater than 10 kilometers. At finer horizontal grid spacing, hydrostatic models are unable to correctly represent the processes that govern buoyancy, and so cannot correctly capture convection. For models that intend to span all possible horizontal scales, operational centers have largely employed a non-hydrostatic equation set coupled with an IMEX time-stepping scheme. Note that if we use the hydrostatic approximation, then the vertical velocity equation can no longer be employed, since this condition would basically imply zero time tendency in the vertical velocity. However, hydrostatic models still support vertical velocity. It just needs to be diagnosed from another equation, such as the continuity equation. The hydrostatic approximation is most commonly employed for the equations of motion and pressure coordinates, although technically it can be applied for any choice of vertical coordinate. You've probably seen these equations before in an atmospheric dynamics class. As mentioned, the hydrostatic uh, assumption requires that hydrostatic balance hold at all times. This allows us to greatly simplify our equations. First, the pseudo-density for pressure coordinates reduces to a constant in this case, 
reflecting the fact that under the hydrostatic approximation, the mass within each layer is held constant. Thus, the horizontal pressure gradient term, equal to 1 over m times the gradient of z on pressure sur surfaces, simply becomes minus g times the gradient of z on pressure surfaces, or equivalently, the gradient of geopotential on pressure surfaces. Further, the factors of m all divide out the, of the continuity equation, and the time derivative of m becomes zero. This means that the continuity equation becomes a diagnostic equation relating horizontal velocity to vertical pressure velocity. With the hydrostatic assumption in place, we find the system of atmospheric fluid equations closes with only three prognostic equations, two for dynamics and one for thermodynamics, along with two constraint equations for the vertical pressure velocity and the geopotential. The continuity equation in this case can be integrated from the top of the atmosphere, that is, the surface of zero pressure, to obtain the vertical pressure velocity at each layer. This solves our earlier need for a complex expression for diagnosing omega in pressure coordinates. Although the hydrostatic approximation can be formulated in vertical height coordinates, this is almost never done. While the non-hydrostatic equations have a relatively simple prognostic vertical velocity equation, this equation cannot be used under the hydrostatic approximation. As in the case of pressure coordinates, it leads to a zero right-hand side. As a consequence, the vertical velocity needs to be diagnosed from elsewhere in the equation set, yielding the rather nasty-looking expression shown here. The derivation of this equation can be found in Casahara and Washington in their 1967 paper, and in De Maria in their, in their 1995 paper. So far, we've learned about height coordinates, which work well for non-hydrostatic models, and pressure coordinates, which work well for hydrostatic models. This prompts the question of whether or not there are coordinate systems that work well for both non-hydrostatic and hydrostatic models. In fact, a small modification to the pressure coordinate system does yield a coordinate system that can be used for both hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic models. Consider mass coordinates, also known as hydrostatic pressure coordinates, as described by Laprice in his 1992 paper. In this system, the coordinate is defined as the mass of air above a given point. By construction, this coordinate system is strictly decreasing with height, and so is a monotone system. Observe that for a hydrostatically balanced atmosphere, the mass variable pi is exactly equal to the pressure p. That is, differentiating pi with respect to z yields negative g rho, that is, hydrostatic balance. Under mass coordinates, the pseudo-density is equal to negative 1 over g for both the non-hydrostatic and hydrostatic equation sets. This again enables some significant simplifications for the general equations of motion. However, the horizontal pressure gradient in mass coordinates has two terms in the non-hydrostatic case, which requires us to track the altitude variable z on pi surfaces. Finally, in both the hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic case, the continuity equation is diagnostic which allows us to again obtain pi dot via an integral from the top of the atmosphere to a particular atmospheric model layer. Another choice of vertical coordinate that has been investigated over the past few decades is an isentropic coordinate. This is known as an adiabatic coordinate since it offers some advantages when the atmosphere is adiabatic. Notably, the vertical coordinate velocity, theta dot, is proportional to the diabatic heating in this case. So for adiabatic motion, there is no vertical coordinate velocity, and fluid parcels are confined to surfaces of constant theta. However, at high resolutions, it's not guaranteed that the atmosphere has potential temperature that purely increases with altitude. In regions of strong overturning motion, we have reversals of the isentropes, indicative of atmospheric instability. As a consequence, models using isentropic coordinates generally need to hybridize with another coordinate that allows the system to maintain monotonicity. This table summarizes the four vertical coordinate systems discussed in this lecture. Height coordinates work well for non-hydrostatic models, but are difficult to employ for hydrostatic models because of the difficulty in diagnosing the vertical velocity. Pressure coordinates are almost universally employed for hydrostatic models, but are difficult to employ in non-hydrostatic models because of the dif difficulty in diagnosing omega and because pressure can sometimes be non-monotonic. Mass coordinates work well for both non-hydrostatic and hydrostatic models and reduce to pressure coordinates in the hydrostatic case. Finally, potential temperature has been considered for models, although it still presents many challenges that have prevented its wide-scale employ. Another option for vertical coordinates is to employ semi-Lagrangian methods for the vertical, analogous to the semi-Lagrangian methods we discussed in Lecture 4. When employed, 
in the vertical. These coordinates are referred to as semi-Lagrangian coordinates or floating Lagrangian coordinates. Much like the semi-Lagrangian method discussed in Lecture 4, there is a risk of these coordinates bunching up or expanding, particularly in the context of strong vertical motion. Thus, it is common to remap the deformed data fields to a reference grid every 15 or 30 minutes, depending on the rate of deformation. Semi-Lagrangian coordinates were introduced in a 1945 paper by Starr and have been employed in a number of models, including CAM-FV, CAM-SE, and the FV cube dynamical core. To employ these methods, we observe that in the absence of sources and sinks, the transport equation for an arbitrary scalar s is simply ds dt equals zero. If we initialize s so that it takes on monotonic values in the vertical, for example, if we set s equal to altitude, then we can employ s as a vertical coordinate variable. As a consequence, the coordinate velocity variable is exactly zero when layers are floating. This reflects the fact that, surf that fluid on any S surface will stay on an S surface by construction. As a result, any terms involving eta dot in the generalized fluid equations ends up being exactly zero. It's important to track the reference coordinate variable, for instance height, as a prognostic variable so that one can easily remap data back to the reference grid. In the semi-Lagrangian context, the remapping procedure takes the place of vertical transport. Now that we've chosen our vertical coordinate system, we've got a major challenge ahead. How to deal with the bottom boundary condition. The Earth's rough topographic surface means that dynamical core developers need to take care in correctly representing the boundary condition, but also take care that it isn't a driver for artificial noise in the bottom boundary. There are generally three ways to represent topography in atmospheric models. First, we can implement step topography, where a cell is considered filled if a given fraction of it is underground. In this case, the topography presents a lateral boundary condition to the model. Second, we can use a numerical technique known as shaved cells or embedded boundaries. This method modifies the numerical method to account for the fact that part of a cell is occupied by a solid. Third, we can modify our vertical coordinate system so that the planetary surface is also a coordinate surface. This is usually performed via coordinate stretching and uses the mathematical machinery we've discussed earlier in this lecture. Step topography is one of the easier methods to implement, but tends to introduce strong, unphysical, and spurious oscillations. It also allows for accurate representation of the horizontal pressure gradient force, since the horizontal derivatives are taken along constant height surfaces. However, this approximation is a poor representation of the underlying topography, and introduces hard corners that are responsible for generating spurious noise. These hard corners can excite the high frequency modes, leading to excess energy deposited into wave modes that are unphysical. The figure here from Adcroft et al. 1997 shows a noisy flow produced by this choice. In order to improve on the effects of step topography, some models instead use shaved cells or embedded boundary methods to account for the lower boundary. Perhaps the most well-known model to do so is the OLAM model, which is employed by the US EPA. Shaved cells refers to using grid boxes that are altered or shaved to account for the presence of topography, whereas embedded boundaries refers to the employ of underground cells with boundary conditions chosen so that the reconstructed subgrid scale velocity is zero along the planetary surface. Both methods allow for accurate treatment of the pressure gradient force, as again horizontal derivatives are taken along surfaces of constant altitude. Implemented well, these methods also allow for accurate treatment of topography and avoid the spurious oscillations we saw with step topography. However, for shaved cells, small grid cells can affect the maximum time step size, so care needs to be taken to manage these cells well. For embedded boundaries, the developer requires a deep understanding of how the numerical method handles the subgrid scale reconstruction so that, so that it can effectively revert, be reverse engineered. Research is ongoing on how to effectively apply these methods. It is notable that these methods also enable the representation of perfectly vertical surfaces, such as we might see in an urban environment. Thus, they have been used in WARF as part of urban dispersion models. The third and most common approach for handling the bottom boundary is via terrain following coordinates. This approach has been the standard for years in atmospheric modeling systems. And although developers have often lamented the fact that it does cause issues with the accurate representation or evaluation of the horizontal pressure gradient force. 
In order to employ terrain following coordinates, we use a modified vertical coordinate that is chosen so that the bottom boundary is a coordinate surface. As discussed in the last section, this choice means that the horizontal pressure gradient force will have two terms. For steady flows, we would expect exact cancellation of these two terms, which is difficult to achieve in a discrete context. Consequently, errors emerge in the estimation of the horizontal pressure gradient force, particularly near steep topography. Some common choices of terrain following coordinates are shown on this slide. Con conversationally, terrain following coordinates are often referred to as sigma coordinates following Norman Phillips' 1957 paper. In his original paper, Phillips defined a coordinate as pressure divided by surface pressure, so that the bottom boundary corresponded to sigma equals 1. Another popular terrain following coordinate is the Galchen and Somerville coordinate, which is defined for models using a height based coordinate. An analogous coordinate was used in Skamarok and Klemp in their 2008 paper, using mass based vertical coordinates. More complicated hybrid coordinates were introduced that set a maximum height on the effect of the topographic stretching, such as the Simmons and Burridge 1981 coordinate. In Schar's 2002 paper, he defined a coordinate that had multiple horizontal scales so that it would appear to smooth out as one went to higher altitudes. The employ of these hybrid coordinates is justified using high-altitude advection experiments, where a constant flow pushes a tracer blob over topography. For coordinate choices that trigger oscillations in coordinate surfaces at high altitudes, spurious noise can be produced as in the top figure. The Simmons and Burridge hybrid coordinate improves on the quality of the solution, although some oscillations are still visible in the flow, while the Schar hybrid coordinate produces a smooth solution even as the blob passes over topography. Notably, there is also a clear trade-off between complexity and simulation quality, as the Sigma coordinate is the simplest to implement, while the Schar coordinate is the most complex. The next topic we'll touch on today has to do with computational modes in non-hydrostatic models. We've already discussed computational modes in the horizontal, but they can be far more problematic in the vertical. In the vertical, one cannot easily rely on numerical viscosity to eliminate spurious behavior, since that could affect atmospheric stratification. In order to understand how computational modes emerge, we will consider three possible staggerings of data in the vertical. In a vertically unstaggered model, all variables, including density, horizontal velocity, vertical velocity, and a second thermodynamic variable, often potential temperature, are found on model levels. Under vertical Lorentz staggering, the vertical velocity is instead placed on model, surface, or model interfaces. This allows it to be exactly prescribed as part of the boundary conditions at the model bottom and top. Under vertical charney phillips staggering, the vertical velocity and the potential temperature are both placed on vertical interfaces, while density and horizontal velocity remain on levels. To understand the type of computational modes that could arise, we only need to examine the vertical velocity equation. If we linearize this equation about a stationary, vertically dependent, and hydrostatically balanced reference state, we obtain the linearized vertical velocity equation shown here. Two terms arise in this linearization a buoyancy term related to density perturbations, and a term associated with pressure gradients and wave propagation. Let's first consider what happens when we discretize this second term on an unstaggered grid. Since W is co-located with pressure, we must employ a centered difference operator to calculate the update equation for W. However, as we've already learned, the centered difference operator is blind to two delta Z modes. We could add an arbitrary sawtooth mode to the pressure field, and the resulting pattern would still produce a zero vertical velocity tendency. This has severe consequences in non-hydrostatic atmospheric models, particularly when the courant number is pushed far above one with an implicit scheme. Indeed, using an unstaggered method in the vertical leads to very obvious spurious oscillations in the W and pressure fields. As a consequence, unstaggered methods are almost never employed in operational models. The Lorentz staggering addresses this issue by placing W on interfaces instead of on model levels. As a result, the vertical acts more like a 1D staggered scheme or Arakawa C grid, so it doesn't possess a computational mode. However, there is more than one term in this linearization that is relevant to the study of computational modes. If we neglect the time evolution of W and instead focus on what kind of perturbations satisfy hydrostatic balance, we obtain a discretization like the one shown on the second line of this slide. 
Observe that the center di central difference operator again appears in this expression, potentially indicative of a computational mode. Indeed, under the Lorentz configuration, since the thermodynamic variables are co-located, we can add any 2 delta z wave to the pressure field and obtain a field that is again in hydrostatic balance. This computational mode, although undesirable, isn't as severe as the computational mode seen in the unstaggered configuration. This is because it is not tied to the time evolution of W, and so is not amplified artificially when we solve for the effects of the vertically propagating waves. That said, the computational mode generally disappears if the secondary ther thermodynamic variable is placed on model interfaces. That is, the thermodynamic variables are staggered with respect to one another. This leads to the family of charney phillips staggerings. The most common configuration of this type places potential temperature on model interfaces while keeping density on model levels. It can be shown that this particular configuration not only removes the computational mode, but also improves the quality of simulated waves in the whole model. With that said, there are many possible choices of vertical staggering besides the ones chosen here. To give an example, the non-hydrostatic home dynamical core in E3SM uses a Lorentz staggering and a hydrostatic mass-based floating Lagrangian coordinate with W and Z on model interfaces. Accurate representation of waves generally requires us to minimize the number of finite difference operators over 2 delta Z, which can only be achieved with some very specific choices of staggering. Though these staggerings have been comprehensively analyzed by Thuburn and Woolings in their 2005 paper in the three non-hydrostatic friendly coordinate systems discussed in this lecture. All right, that has been your thorough introduction to the complications introduced by vertical structure in the atmosphere. Next time, we'll be turning our attention to some of the choices that get swept under the rug in atmospheric dynamical cores, including fixers, filters, and numerical diffusion.